put yourself in the situation of Cyrus. You have tried and failed to seize the kingship once. Consequently, you were humiliated and banished from the royal court. You have limited funds and your domain, which you have been sent back to, has been severely reduced. On top of that, King has installed hostile officials within and around your territory, immediately engaging you in conflict. Seems like a difficult, if not impossible, situation to face. Let me quote Plutarch who gives us Cyrus' feelings in these difficult circumstances. He says, Cyrus was not satisfied with the office assigned to him, nor mindful of his release, but only of his arrest, and his anger made him more eager than before to secure his kingdom. It seems that this setback only intensified his ambitions. Therefore, he sets out to secure the kingdom a second time. This time, he will force his brother into one decisive battle. From 404 to 401 BCE, he plans and organizes his expedition in secret. His position was problematic. Still, there were factors working in his favor. First, being satrap of much of Asia Minor, he could march towards Babylon without having to worry about the West, except for the Sophonies, situated in the province of Caria, south of Lydia. Although the majority of Greek cities in Asia Minor favored Cyrus due to his support in their revolt against Athenian hegemony in the Aegean Sea. Originally, Sophonis handled the conflict, overseeing the border provinces in the west, but because Darius wasn't pleased with his plan of non-intervention, Cyrus was sent to replace him. The Sophonis made himself very unpopular with the Greeks living under Persian rule because of his lack of support in the war. To say it bluntly, the Sophonis despised the Greeks and thereby favored watching on as they fought each other. Second, the Peloponnesian War, having recently concluded, left the Greek economy in a bad state. Many of the veterans that fought in this conflict returned home, only to find that there was no work and no way to provide for themselves and their families. The easiest way to earn money for them was to become mercenary soldiers. This gave Cyrus the opportunity to quickly raise an experienced army. But the biggest obstacle for Cyrus was how to raise a sizable army without raising suspicion with the king. His solution was to financially support various minor conflicts in the region and in the process of doing this, having many smaller mercenary armies on standby. He helped finance armies in Thessaly, Boeotia and for a punitive attack against the Thracians. To deal with the Thracians, he found a Greek named Clearchus, who already employed an army ready for this assignment. Clearchus was a former Spartan tyrant, living in exile in Byzantium. The way he governed Byzantium, but he was still officially supported by Sparta, made him deeply unpopular with its inhabitants. Consequently, the people of Byzantium rebelled and took back control of the city. Clearchus was recalled to Sparta, as the Spartans realized that his brutal rule led to the rebellion of the city. Rather than obeying, Clearchus raised a mercenary army and himself took back control of Byzantium, which made the Spartans renounce and banish him. Xenophon writes extensively about Clearchus and his role as leader of the entire Greek mercenary contingent. He apparently made a good impression on the prince, since Clearchus was the only one Cyrus told at the beginning of the march what his true objective was. At Sardis, Cyrus assembles about 20,000 locally recruited 
Persian soldiers. He needed to give his Greeks time to link up with the army. Also, for an army of the size that he intended for, he required enough funds. To accomplish all of this, he first starts out a war against several of the officials and satraps that were appointed by the king to oppose him, which he accomplishes, ending up at the siege of Miletus, the capital of the Sophonies. The siege gave him an excuse for the army he was gathering. Cyrus sent envoys to the king, informing him of his plan to take the Sophonies, Ionian cities. He argued that this was necessary since the people wanted him to govern and were opposed to the Sophonies. This ploy managed to set the king at ease, thinking that his brother wanted to secure his provinces and engage the Sophonies. With this move, he also managed to secure the loyalty of the West, allowing him to gain valuable tax revenue and to bolster his forces with all those opposed to the Sophonies. Cyrus was off to a good start. After some time, the prince had assembled his entire host at Miletus, according to modern estimates, some 30,000 soldiers, consisting of a mixed 20,000 strong army of Persians under the command of Arius and Ionian Greeks under the command of Minon. Additionally, of course, the 10,000 Greek mercenaries led by Clearchus. It is here, Cyrus, unbeknownst to his men, starts his expedition to defeat his brother in battle and take the kingship. One thing he knows is that his army would not support a campaign against the king. His Persians had still ultimate loyalty towards the king and the Greeks would be resistant to this plan. Also, the king, knowing outrightly of his rebellion, would surely move against him straight away, making any planned expedition hardly viable. So how will Cyrus accomplish his goals? To manage both internal desertion and external threat, Cyrus conjures up a narrative. He first frames his expedition as merely a war between satraps, making the king believe there is still a possibility for reconciliation. He also secures the loyalty of his army by continuing to pay tribute to the king assuring them that he is in recognition of the king's supreme authority. His plan is to lead his army from point to point, presenting one pretext after another, and each time promising them more pay, step by step, moving them closer to Babylon. In 401 BCE, Cyrus lifts the siege of Miletus and journeys inland with the aim of dealing with the Pisidians. Once Cyrus leaves the area, he appoints loyal governors to his provinces in Asia Minor. The Sophonies, alarmed at the size of Cyrus' army and no longer in control of his provinces, takes the quickest way to Babylon to inform the king of Cyrus and his army marching east. The army sets out, but rather than attacking any settlement in Pisidia, they march straight through the territory into the bordering province of Cilicia. At this point, the mercenary contingent is already distrustful of Cyrus' intentions and hasn't received their promised payment. This situation culminates in a mutiny by the Greeks. Fortunately, Cyrus is visited by the Cilician queen Epiaxa, who promises to support him financially. To secure this funding, Cyrus marches his army to the Cilician capital at Tarsus. Here, the queen, having arrived previously, convinced her husband, the Cilician king, to support Cyrus in his endeavor. Of course, this wasn't done out of goodwill, but the king of Cilicia was hoping that as soon as Cyrus would be Achaemenid ruler, he would gain more influence in the royal court. Additionally, Cyrus, after receiving the funds from the king of Cilicia, promised not to plunder his domain. The army remained at Tarsus. Apparently, the Greeks 
were satisfied with their pay, but still refused to continue the march, since they already suspected they were moving against the Achaemenid monarch. Cleacus, being responsible for the Greeks, first tries to force the soldiers to continue the expedition. Cleacus' brutal reaction does not sit well with the Greeks, and Xenophon informs us that they start throwing stones at him, nearly killing him in this act of defiance. But Cleacus is also cunning, so he completely changes face. He gathers all the minor Greek commanders and starts to cry and give an emotional speech, appealing to their pride, saying that if they would stop now, either he must betray them and keep his friendship with Cyrus, or he would have to lie to Cyrus to stick to them. He was basically making himself out to be the victim and Cyrus the antagonist for putting him in this predicament. Without admitting to them that Cyrus' intention is to battle Artaxerxes, he made a big show of siding with the Greeks. The prince, blissfully unaware of this development, tries to summon Cleacus. Cleacus makes a big show of refusing this command, but in secret sends a messenger to Cyrus, assuring him that all is well. Next, one of the commanders, probably instructed by Cleacus, tells everyone of the dangers of just marching back to Greece. Cleacus next speaks about other famous Greek expeditions and how the loyalty and bravery of those soldiers was rewarded. Finally, Cleacus, taking along some of the commanders, goes to Cyrus to question him about his objectives. Cyrus tells him that he wants to deal with a revolt in Syria. Although still being doubtful, they agree to his proposal. The army next moves to Issus. It is here that a small Spartan hoplite force arrives by ship to join Cyrus' forces. The Spartans wanted to officially signify their support for Cyrus. Thereafter, Cyrus marches his army to Mariandas. One of the king's military leaders, Aprocomus, could have stopped his army's advance by blocking the Syrian gates, a natural choke point along the way. But again, Cyrus is lucky, as Aprocomus was too far south to reach his position in time. At this point, we might ask ourselves what the king was doing while this was going on. Well, there are two good explanations as to why Cyrus was able to march seemingly unopposed into the heart of the empire. First, Cyrus' propaganda might have convinced the royal court of his supposed intentions. Second, there's evidence to suggest that in the spring of 401 BCE, the king was preoccupied with planning an invasion of rebellious Egypt. This seems likely since Aprocomus had already assembled a military force in southern Phoenicia at a usual gathering point for the Persian campaigns against Egypt. Also, spring was the ideal time to campaign in Egypt because of the flooding of the Nile from July to November. Artaxerxes probably did not fully recognize the danger of the situation, although Xenophon does report that the king had started to gather an army while Cyrus was still in Asia Minor, maybe planning another campaign, or because of the advice of his officers, most notably to Sarfanes. From there, the prince marches his forces inland to Thapsacus, from the Greek meaning pontoon, because of its pontoon bridge. This city had enjoyed considerable importance during the Achaemenid period and possibly earlier as a major crossing of the Euphrates and the main link between Syria and Mesopotamia. Its strategic importance is illustrated by the fact that 70 years after Cyrus' expedition, it would be used by Alexander and his Macedonians in pursuit of then Achaemenid king of kings, Darius III. 
Arriving at Thapsakas, Cyrus rests for a few days. It is here he finally calls together his Greek commanders and admits that his goal is to march on Babylon to confront King Artaxerxes in battle. He promises important positions and much wealth to all those present, and the commanders, already having come this far, begrudgingly agree. In turn, they give rousing speeches to their men, trying to convince them of supporting Cyrus, eventually winning them over by distributing a year's worth of pay and silver for their continued loyalty. This news, in time, reaches the king, who consequently starts preparing for the coming battle. Because of his position, Aprocomus wasn't able to join Artaxerxes for the battle, but he does send some cavalry to aid the king. Earlier overtaking the invading army, this cavalry unit destroys the bridge at Thapsacus to slow the enemy's advance down. It is unclear what Aprocomus allegiances were. It seems he could have taken more action, but maybe wanted to wait and see how the conflict would turn out. Prince notices the unusually low tide of the Euphrates River and uses this to his advantage. He leads his men to it and in a show of divine support crosses the Euphrates, giving extensive speeches about the god's support for his endeavor. The army crosses the Euphrates and starts its march south with the river to its right towards Babylon. Moving forward, the terrain was getting more arid which made the army's supply situation difficult. The problems with provisioning the army was made even worse by the enemy burning all food stocks ahead. The account tells us that Cyrus would force march his men along the Euphrates, only making necessary stops. Close to Babylon, at the city of Charmanti, Cyrus' entire mission nearly derails over the minor disagreement of a few Greek soldiers. Apparently, a Athenian and a Spartan soldier had a feud about the water distribution, and Clearchus intervened, judging the Spartan soldier as correct and giving the Athenian soldier a beating. This situation escalated quickly into a conflict between two factions, both preparing for battle. In the last moment, Cyrus arrives to stop the Greeks from tearing each other apart. He steps between the opposing hoplite formations and reminds them of their shared goal and the dangers of weakening themselves in a conflict that would leave them vulnerable for the upcoming battle. His speech de-escalates the situation and the Greeks disperse. This incident demonstrates that the Greeks were far from a united group. They were still very different, being more loyal to their city and region than any overarching Greek identity. This also coincides with another threat to Cyrus. During the expedition, his relationship with the Greeks had somewhat improved, but there was growing resistance from his Persian followers, especially after his announcement at Thapsacus. This is demonstrated by the plot of Orontes. Orontes was a high-ranking Persian official in Cyrus' army. He had quite a relationship with Cyrus, twice having fought against him, but ultimately working with him. Orontes offered Cyrus that he would cut down or capture the enemies that were burning the potential provisions ahead of the advancing army. In order to do that, he asked for a thousand horsemen. When Cyrus agreed, Orontes secretly wrote to the king, promising to join him with as many horsemen as he was able to acquire. But the messenger to whom the letter had been entrusted betrayed him and brought the message to the prince. Interesting is that when Cyrus discovered the plot, he did not just appoint Persian nobles, but also some of the Greeks as judges in order to condemn Orontes. Having dealt with this, Cyrus orders his soldiers to continue their trek south. According to reports, 
king's forces were close by, so from here on out, Cyrus continues to march his men in battle formation. After some time, they discover a long ditch that was dug, so it seemed, by the enemy army, probably to prepare the area as a suitable battlefield. The only thing missing was the actual enemy army. It seemed that for some reason they were retreating before Cyrus. This incident is used by Cyrus to lift his man's morale. The invaders pursue the king and his forces further south. At the most proximate point between the Euphrates and the Tigris, the army encounters the Median Wall. A structure built during the zenith of the Neo-Babylonian Empire around two centuries earlier. The wall was built to prevent any potential invasion by the Medes from the north, hence the name Median Wall. Xenophon describes this enormous wall as 6 meters wide and 30 meters high. According to his account, it was supposed to have been 110 kilometers long. It must have been quite a sight to behold. To their surprise, they find the structure defenseless and continue the pursuit. Around three days later, close to the village of Kunaxa, the scout returns to report that the king's army is closing in. Alarmed at this message, Cyrus quickly assembles his forces into battle formation. Clearchus and his Greeks were assigned to the right, next to the Euphrates River. The left was held by Minon, and the center was a mix of Persian units commanded by Arias and heavy shock cavalry personally commanded by the prince. Aware of being outnumbered by his brother's army, he decides to sacrifice the depth of the army's ranks to match the length of the enemy's forces. Having inferior numbers meant there was always a terrifying threat of being outflanked. It is reported that the Greeks expected the Persian army, often referred to as barbarians, to immediately on arriving on the battlefield, without any preparation or planning, charge at them. Contrary to this assumption, after arriving, the Persians form for battle in good order. Our primary sources give us outlandish estimations of the size of Ataxerxes' army. It is generally accepted that the king's forces numbered only about 60,000. The king apparently lacked time to assemble a more numerous host. The battle itself is reported on primarily by Xenophon and Cetesius. Both were personally involved in the battle in different capacities. Xenophon being part of the Greek mercenary contingent and Cetesius as the physician of the king. In some cases their accounts contradict, in some they match up. Some things they recorded must have been later additions or even just made up by themselves, since their positions in the battle did not give them supreme awareness of the events. Plutarch has major criticisms of Cetesia's work, noting a few instances in which he outrightly fabricated parts of his account. He also draws attention to the love of the sensational in his narrative. Adaxerxes forms his battle lines in the following order. Sarfanes, with the most elite infantry contingents available, was to oppose the Greeks on the Persian left flank. The king was joined by one of his generals, Gogarius, in the center, and commanded the cavalry supported by mixed detachments of light infantry and missile units. On the Persian far right, Arbarchis was stationed with various Asiatic troops. The Persians placed several scythe chariots in front of their lines. These chariots served the purpose of breaking the enemy's formation and would, if successful in their charge, additionally demoralize the enemy. The Persians initiated the battle with a frontal charge by the scythe chariots. This attack proved ineffective because many of the horses disobeyed and pulled their wagons away from the battlefield, and those that did manage to attack were unsuccessful. The invading army had countered this charge by opening their ranks and letting the chariots through, killing the charioteers in this maneuver. Next, the 
The Greeks on the right slowly and in formation moved towards the Sarthenes and the Persian left. As soon as they entered missile range, they charged the enemy line. Apparently, the Persians opposing them disintegrated and fled from the charging Greeks. The Greeks continued their charge, pursuing them all the way off the battlefield, inflicting heavy casualties. In the center, Artaxerxes clashes with his brother Cyrus. The prince and his units come out on top of this encounter, and Artaxerxes' men must slowly give ground. In this instance, Cyrus might have, instead of intensifying the attack, strengthened his line and waited for the Greeks to reinforce him and thereby win the center. But he impetuously moved forward deeper into enemy lines. On the left, Minon and his men are routed off the battlefield and flee all the way back to their camp, making a heroic last stand, but getting completely defeated. Back in the center, the conflict of the two brothers is ultimately decided. After heavy fighting, Cyrus, or one of his men, managed to wound the king, who consequently retreats from the battlefield and gets his wound treated. Cyrus, having nearly achieved his aim, now finds himself having advanced too far into enemy lines. His bodyguards around him are cut down, and after being thrown off his horse, so is he. It can be said that Cyrus won the battle, but in his death the cause was lost. Our ancient source holds Clearchus responsible for the outcome of the battle. Seeing the enemy's forces, Cyrus had ordered Clearchus to the center, understanding the need to win quickly against the king and his personal units. Clearchus disobeyed the order. In all likelihood, he was focused on self-preservation, not wanting to risk his men by exposing the hoplite's unprotected right flank, preferring to use the Euphrates River as a natural shield against flanking attacks. He might have reasoned that winning a quick victory on the right meant he could turn around and encircle the center. Whatever he might have thought, his pursuit of the enemy meant his forces were unable to join the crucial battle in the center. It has to be said that the outcome of this battle and the successor to the Achaemenid Empire had a profound effect on the ensuing events, especially when it came to the West and the relations to the Greeks. Contrary to his brother, Cyrus the Younger would have had a very different foreign policy post Kunaxa. Cyrus was exceedingly open to cooperating with the Greeks and might have continued supporting certain Greek factions, most notably the Spartans. Keeping the Greeks divided like this and integrating Greek military contingents into the empire might have helped prolong its rule. Don't get me wrong, there were challenges facing any Achaemenid monarch, and the empire was in decline. But it could have survived and even flourished for a longer period. Maybe even giving us a more Persian-centric view of ancient history. <laughs>